this is all about. Uh, my name is Dan Buscombe. I am uh, currently a consultant uh, contractor for the US Geological Survey um, Coastal Marine Geology Division in Santa Cruz and uh, formerly a professor at Northern Arizona University. Um, and, for, and prior to that, I was a uh, geologist working at the Grand Canyon Monitor and Research Center, uh, which is a USGS office in Flagstaff, Arizona. And um, I got into uh, machine learning methods as sort of an early adopter of some of the methods um, that were being used for seafloor characterization. And so I sort of got into um, machine learning methods using bathymetry and backscatter data back in 2012. And then from there, I've sort of uh, developed workflows using various types of machine learning algorithms for various types of problems in geology and ecology, um, using sort of uh, imagery primarily from drones and airplanes, um, and some, some work with satellites, and also a lot of work uh, using machine learning um, workflows with um, submarine and uh, sort of subaqueous uh, platforms and subaqueous data as well. Uh, so have uh, don't have a background in computer science. Um, my background is in geography, geology, and oceanography. Um, and I imagine most of you have uh, similar backgrounds and that you're sort of coming at this from a similar perspective to me, hopefully. Um, obviously, the, the workflows that you're going to see today, they're very specific to, uh, you know, a particular data set, uh, also very specific in terms of they've been written by myself and uh, not too many collaborators. Uh, so far, but but um, but also the the specifics of the model um, and the various training strategies that we that we sort of use with the model. Um, but hopefully along the way, I'm going to uh, highlight some of the areas that uh, there is room for for sort of uh, expansion and extension uh, on, and replacement of uh, various workflows with others. Um, so even though that the 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 workflow is obviously going to be very specific to the data and the and the particular choices that I've made about the workflow. Hopefully, I'm going to impart a few general concepts uh, that you can sort of take home and uh, sort of start developing your own workflows um, using perhaps using some of these materials as a starting point. Um, kind of difficult figuring out how many people are actually going to show up to this. We currently have 44. I guess I'll just give it another couple of minutes um, and then I'll just sort of get going here. But um, if anyone has any burning questions or big issues with accessing the materials or anything like that, then I guess now would be a good time to unmute yourself and let me know. And I'll assume uh, if you're all silent, I'll assume that you managed to get onto the or the website that I made for this, and then you managed to navigate to the Google Colab from there. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And hopefully you see uh, my web browser. I've just got one eye here on uh, my participants because I need to let them in as they come in. All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I gave the spiel of who I am. I'm Dan Buscombe, I work for uh, I'm self-employed nowadays, uh, but I contract for the U.S. Geological Survey, and I'm formerly a professor at NAU. My background is not computer science or, um, or particularly remote sensing, but I have uh, sort of gravitated towards both of those topics over the course of my career. Um, and in particular, um, I'm sort of very, very engaged with uh, developing workflows for um, applying sort of machine learning, sort of state-of-the-art, or established machine learning sort of algorithms, and I like to apply them to uh, to to the to, to the science problems that I'm working on. And I've worked um, both above water and below water. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done with machine learning started out in the fluvial world, uh, looking at um, bathymetry and backscatter 
data and trying to uh, sort of use machine learning processes to uh, convert that into uh, useful useful products for us and then I'm sort of now in the process of translating some of those workflows and ideas and applications and, um, over to uh, sub-aerial remote sensing and my particular interest is uh, coastal remote sensing um, in particular hurricane impacts um, and so a lot of the workflow that I'm going to be showing you today has been researched by myself but it's using models that weren't originally developed by myself um, they were developed by uh, computer scientists uh, working at sort of the the low level algorithm development and what you're going to see today is and it's an example of how you might take a sort of uh, a sophisticated uh, machine learning algorithm or, or workflow and sort of adapt that to, to you towards your own purposes um, so we've got uh, 46 people here um, I'm going to keep admitting people as they show up um, everyone's muted or everyone should be muted at this point if you're not muted please mute yourself um, I will be fielding questions as we go um, you are welcome to ask a question at any time um, please ask questions because otherwise it's going to feel really weird for me uh, speaking to uh, my computer for the next two hours um, so I really I really hope that you're able to engage with me ask questions and uh, we can have a sort of a stimulating conversation as well as a demonstration of a particular workflow. Um, all right. Um, oh, one more people, one more person to admit. Right. So and this is where. Recorded? Yes, we are being recorded. Um, so for that reason, um, if you can keep your questions sort of concise and to the point. That would be ideal for the for anyone who's listening to this afterwards. I don't actually know what system has planned for the recording, but I believe uh, it, it will be edited and posted on the system's website, perhaps. So it will be made public. That is correct, then. Yes. Thank you. And the other thing I'd like to mention is that um, all of these materials I've made uh public through this website i haven't yet advertised this particular website that you're looking at uh, because i obviously i wanted all of the systems folks to get the first first dibs on this stuff but also because i i really want your feedback um and i'm i'm hoping to to use what i learn uh today and tomorrow to to keep evolving this 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 workflow and this material so it's sort of generally useful for folks and then as soon as i got it to a point that i'm happy with I'm going to sort of broadcast it more widely. So these, so these materials um, and more actually will be available through uh, through this through this means through these means. Okay. Um, so hopefully you got to this point here and you saw this website. Uh, you saw the email with the instructions and that this isn't going to be too much of a surprise. But I'm just going to go through this. Uh, I want to start by thanking US uh, US Coastal Marine Hazards and Resources Program and the USGS CDI community for supporting me and also for systems obviously for inviting me. Um, I actually did a systems work uh, sh a clinic, not workshop, clinic. I did a systems clinic last year and it was a lot of fun. And uh, I think a lot of people got um, something out of it and so they asked me back. And this time I asked for two slots because I wanted to um, <laughs> talk a little bit more detail about some of these models and have a bit more time to ask uh, uh, to answer questions and and to to talk through people's sort of specific uh, ideas or concerns so here we are so so hopefully you're here because you've signed up for both courses but obviously um, th these materials are available online so if you don't feel like you'd need uh, to, to listen to me talk then you still have access to these to these materials and um, you know, so this is for anybody really who's interested. Any anyone who's a sort of a professional scientist, especially working in geology and ecology, um, and um, they've they have need of um, image segmentation for whatever reason. So uh, you know, I put together this. I've researched and put together a workflow that seems to work fairly well for um, for sort of generic segmentation problems, at least the ones that I've been working on. Um, and I've, the, the particular workflow that we're going to see today is harnessing a, a model called a UNET, uh, which is a deep learning 
um, image segmentation model. And I'll talk about what that means. Um, but I found that this particular uh, unit that I've, 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 I've adapted, um, it, it seems to work fairly well for a, a lot, lots of different types of um, image segmentation tasks. So I'm sort of, that's why I'm sort of confident in presenting this stuff um, in, to, to such a diverse group, because I think, um, I think a lot of folks um, might find utility in this approach. Um, and, and so I feel like I can say that because I've used this particular model for big scale stuff, um, you know, segmenting um, lakes and seas and things like that from large format imagery, like satellite imagery. Uh, relatively low spatial resolution imagery, um, but also uh, very sh uh, close range photography too, um, all the way down to very, very uh, close range um, photography. So there's something about this particular model that um, I think works fairly well for the natural sciences in particular, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think that is the case. Um, that's not to say though, obviously, that this is a, cat, is a, a generic workflow that would transfer perfectly to anybody and anybody's uh, problems or, ta or tasks um, obviously but but still I think there's uh, there's something in this model that that, that that a number of different folks might find useful I'm trying to admit a one particular person here and the button isn't working here we go okay um, so we're up to 49 people now apparently there's still another 20 people to show up but I'm, I'm guessing we're about we're, we're 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 converging to a point where there's no more people um, so uh, the prerequisites. Um, this is this is a fairly uh, involved uh, workflow in some respects because it has a lot of Python code in it. Um, it needs a lot of Python code in order to work because we're sort of a lot of that Python code is 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 sort of wrangling the data, and that's a big part of what um, I want to present here. Um, you know, uh, uh, machine learning is all about the data. Um, it's not so much about the model, even though um, a lot of models get promoted as being um, as being these generic models, like I just did. It really is also about understanding your data uh, and 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 having enough uh, programming ability to to coerce your data or to to get your data into a format that's amenable to uh, a machine learning workflow. And there's and in particular, deep learning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about. A, f a few of those considerations for um, uh, for taking these 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 materials and and applying them to your own data and that's and hopefully you can ask me a lot of questions about um, about that as well. Um, but if you're, um, I'm hoping that you have that you all have at least some familiarity and experience with Python. Um, this is, as I say, it's a pretty Python heavy uh, workflow, and if you get lost along the way, um, then it might be because there's a particular Python. Uh, Pythonic thing that's not been understood, um, and and if you can if you can communicate to me that uh, during the workflow, then I, I would appreciate that because as I say, I'm trying to I'm trying to evolve this as we go. This is the first time that I've presented these materials too, um, so uh, any feedback that you have as we go would be great. Um, what else did I want to say at this juncture? So we are we're going to be using Jupiter, um, which is a is uh, it's going to be a convenient way for us to uh, go through these materials uh, using Google Colab, which is a, essentially an online, uh, a free to use online cloud computer that hosts Jupyter notebooks. Jupyter notebooks are notebooks that uh, contain both Python pro pro code as well as rich text and video and media and other things in order to sort of uh, wrap your code into a, a way that is easy to teach and collaborate. Um, but if you're doing um, deep learning uh, on your own data, um, on especially very large data sets, then uh, the onus is on you to es essentially adapt these workflows to a, a desktop computer. Um, the, I've deliberately strayed away from that in particular for this uh, systems class because um, there's, there's still uh, the installation of Python and the updating of various libraries and having uh, uh, environments that uh, are clean and are sort of useful for you and are not going to break, that's actually a fairly difficult thing if you're, uh, especially if you're starting out. And that can be a big barrier to, to, um, 
uh, you know, it's a, a, it's a, it's a big significant barrier, especially at entry level um, deep learning stuff. So um, Google Colab is going to be a really uh, useful thing for us. All right, let's get on. Um, I want to go straight to this, uh, this first lesson is what we're going to be spending the rest of uh, our time on. Um, I did, uh, I did provide a getting started with TensorFlow, uh, which is what you're looking at on this screen here. Hopefully uh, a few of you who have no experience with TensorFlow managed to get to, to that and go through that workflow. That workflow is very similar actually to a number of different tutorials that you might find online. I linked to a few of those in, in, the, in the course website. Um, so if you are struggling with some of the concepts and, and some of the syntax, uh, then I would encourage you to sort of go back to maybe that uh, particular uh, tutorial or, or, or go to one of those that were linked. But I'm not going to be starting with this because I'm going to assume here that you have a basic uh, grip of TensorFlow and um, we can start here, which is day one, constructing a generic image segmentation model. Okay, so anyone have any questions, um, burning questions before, before I begin? You're just eager to get on with it. All right. Um, so before we get started here, I'm just gonna sort of go through what it is that we're going to be do, doing and what it is that we're not going to be doing. Um, we are going to be constructing a, um, uh, we're going to be working through a particular workflow that I've put together and researched uh, that works well for segmentation in general. It especially works well for binary segmentation. And what I mean by binary segmentation is, um, is, is uh, segmenting or classifying every pixel of your image, uh, segmenting your Im image into just two classes, uh, the class that you're interested in. And, that, and for us, for this first part, that's going to be vegetation and then a back against the background of everything else. Um, that, nece that isn't necessarily the most state-of-the-art way to do uh, image segmentation for, uh, for, for in particular for um, segmentation tasks that require multiple classes. That type of segmentation is called multi-class segmentation where you have more than two categories. Um, and so obviously that's where the state-of-the-art is. But I wanted to start with a, a more um, a simpler workflow um, for the purposes of the introductory nature of this work, but uh, of this of this clinic, but also um, because I wanted to uh, discuss and impart a particular philosophy that I have is that um, binary segmentations actually are a great way to start any type of segmentation problem, because you don't always know what classes uh, you need, what classes are going to work what classes are actually identifiable by a human and consistently identifiable by a human. Um, and so it's better to start off with uh, treating the segmentation problems as sort of a series of binary decisions. And what I mean by that is if you have a particular data set um, and you have a you know, particular needs of that, you need to segment out a particular thing in your image because you need to enumerate it, you need to track it over time or whatever. Um, the other, the other classes that you don't care about might be, uh, you may not need actually to segment them out explicitly. They might just all fall into a background class that you really don't care about. And sometimes that's advantageous because you have one particular class that you're interested in that's very distinguishable against all of the other, everything else. Um, but you may run into situations obviously where the thing that you're interested in could be confused by the uh, confused of something else. And so you would need to, uh, determine at what point these two things are treated separately or together by the model. And if that's not apparent at the moment, hopefully it becomes apparent as we go through this. I'll, I'll keep reiterating this point if I remember. Um, so in this, in this first part, we're going to be um, using a data set that's the public. It's out there, it's called Aeroscapes. It's pretty good in, so in, in that it has, uh, it's, it's fairly relevant to us in a couple of different ways. Um, it's not sort of a, it's not an ecological or a geological data set by any means, but it does have a lot of the land covers and land classes that you see for, especially from UAV 
um, platforms. So we're going to be using that. Um, it's also because it's public, uh, freely available. Uh, it doesn't sort of interfere with anyone's research program. Um, and it's a, good, it's a good data set to play with because of the number of images and the number of classes. Um, and also, uh, later on, we're going to be using another similar data set uh, called the Semantic Drone data set, which is another publicly available data set that's used for, by folks to develop their methods, uh, to benchmark their methods and uh, things like that. It's not necessarily used for any specific purpose, but it does, for our purposes, have a lot of the same classes. Um, and it's a good case study of how we might take, um, how we might transfer what we've learned from one particular data set in terms of a segmentation task over to another data set. And that, uh, that principle of, uh, it's called transfer learning, is something that you may have come across and I wanted to sort of explain uh, and demonstrate at the end. So the first part, the first uh, the next sort of half an hour or so, 40 minutes, we're going to be going through um, the, 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 the basics of how to uh, set up a model, how to build a model, how to train a model, how to test a model, um, and, um, how the, and then the, the, the last part, we're going to be going over how to then take what we learned from that model and apply it to a different data set for a similar task. Um, if it wasn't already apparent to everybody, there's no need to actually install Python on your computer. We're going to be working through this, just this notebook that you see up on the screen today. Um, but obviously, if you, um, if, you, if you did need to install uh, Python on your computer to do this, and then I'm available um, perhaps at the end to, to, to troubleshoot some of that stuff if you're, if you're having issues with it. Um, what else do I need to say here at this juncture? Hopefully I've covered. The, 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 main input, the, the main thing that, that, that I'm trying to get across here is that um, even though there are many, many, many tutorials that you might follow about TensorFlow and toy sort of examples on the web, there's relatively few uh, um, working examples, sort of nuts and bolts examples of how you might get one of these models to work on a real world or real world data set or a messy data set. And that's obviously what we encounter more commonly in remote sensing, especially for geological and ecological um, applications. So that's what that's really what I focused on. Uh, this doesn't this this workflow doesn't give you um, a, a complete uh, understanding of the of the deep learning methods that are employed. It will superficially talk about some of these things, but the onus is on you to really research these these uh, models themselves. What I'm focused on is sort of demonstrating um, what's possible. Uh, demonstrating a particular workflow with a model that I find to be quite generic. And then hopefully uh, what you get out of this is um, a, a means to sort of take these, these workflows and adapt them for your own particular purposes and your own data. All right, uh, I don't see any more people in the waiting room, so I'm going to go ahead and minimize that. Um, so here we are. If anyone does have a question at any point, then please, I would love to hear your voice. I really would. Um, so this is the, gen the general thing, what we're going to do, we're going to import our libraries that we need. Um, we're going to use the Aeroscapes data set. Uh, we're going to have a look at that, that data in a few different ways. We're going to make some plots of those data. Um, and we're going to uh, set up a, a model to essentially find all of the pixels in the image that are associated with vegetation, which is just one class in, in our, in our multi-class data set. And then at the end, we're going to transfer what we we're going to transfer those that that model essentially to a different data set, and then we're going to start learning on that second data set and see um, how um, and and see sort of just demonstrate uh, how transfer learning could be an extremely useful thing for for you. All right, so here we go. Hopefully you're you're following along here. Um, as I say. Feel free to ask, ask questions. I'm also going to stop at, at points along the way here, especially during model training and things like that. Um, and I, you know, open the floor up for discussion. But for now, um, I'm gonna go ahead and run this first cell. So um, to run a cell, you're hitting, you, you're sort of hitting uh, shift and enter, or you, uh, and if you just keep hitting shift and enter, it will automatically uh, go to the next cell. 
this is a piece of code that's just uh, for the purposes of seeing how much, uh, what hardware you have. The, the notebook is actually set up in such a way um, that the GPU is already, is already loaded, or at least it should be. Um, if you go into runtime and then manage session, oh, sorry, not manage sessions, um, runtime and then change runtime type, you'll see what we have here. Um, this menu here uh, is, uh, we've, we've got the GPU selected because we're actually going to be training a model on a GPU that's hosted on this cloud computer. Um, we could also use a TPU for this. If we selected none, that would mean that the, all of the processing is happening on the CPU, and that's going to take an order of magnitude more time, essentially. Um, most of you, I imagine, have the, the sort of the standard Google Colab account. I actually have a pro account, and so that's why I get an option here of, of a different runtime. Um, but you, you, should, you should just see a standard there, and so that's what you should have. And so. Uh, it's a Linux, uh, it's a Unix-based computer that's actually running this stuff uh, behind the scenes, and so we have access to a, to a few Unix-style commands like NVIDIA SMI, which tells us uh, what GPU we have. I have a Tesla P100. You probably have something a little smaller, um, and it tells you how much how much RAM we have. I've got 13.7 gigabytes of, of RAM. I don't know how much you have, uh, but whatever ha you have should be sufficient. Okay. So this next part here, um, the air escapes data is actually uh, available. It has its own, it has its own GitHub page uh, that I've linked to uh, here. And they actually make their, their data available um, via a Google Drive link. So this little bit of code up here is not too important. It just allows us uh, essentially to download a file from a Google Drive. Um, from a, it, it specifically extracts a particular string out uh, uh, it uses a particular string that's in the URL of of the um, of the Google Drive link, Google Drive link, and it just uses that to download the data, data. The data. Okay, so it's not too important about that function there. What's more important is what the data is. So the data set consists of three thousand two hundred sixty nine images. Um, they're seven seven twenty by seven twenty by three. That's actually fairly small for a, for a UAV image. You're probably working with uh, images that, that are larger. The semantic drone data that we that we're going to look at later on, they're a, they're a, they're a larger format image. They're uh, probably uh, 12, 14 megapixels, something like that. Uh, the classes that we have, these are generic classes. Uh, I didn't want to get too specific for the purposes of this workshop because you're obviously coming at, uh, at this from different places. So I chose a data set that had um, you know these sort of uh, a mixture of natural and unnatural classes. Um, for the most part, um, the the scenes are natural. They're sort of mostly vegetation and, and background, essentially. Uh, background is, uh, I guess, everything that's not, uh, <laughs> that's not anthropogenic or vegetation in this case. Uh, and then they'll say there's a lot of, oh, or sky. And then there's a lot of other um, sort of anthropocentric classes like animals, people, roads. So we're just downloading this file here. And then um, that shouldn't take too long. And then we're just using a couple of these Unix style commands to interrogate our data. That first one, tar, that's uh, just for um, taking a tarball, which is that tar.gz, a compressed tarball, and extracting that um, just in much the same way as you would extract a zip file. And then ls, uh, just, it's just for listing what's in, the, what's in the file system. And I'm piping that to another Unix command here, uh, WCL, which is basically word count line. Uh, so it just essentially just tells me how many images I have in that, in that particular folder. And so my, my imagery, my red, green, blue uh, photographs, they're contained in my AeroScapes JPEGs images. If we go over to this tab over here, hopefully you can see my mouse. If we go over to this tab here, um, you'll see our files. You may need to hit refresh. You can go to AeroScapes and you can actually see uh, what the subfolders are. We're just going to be using uh, JPEG images and segmentation class. You can even, if you're not familiar with Colab, you can actually even, there's a lot of images in here, so it might take a while, but once this goes, you can actually double click on an individual image and actually just have a look at it. Now this is a label image, and so it looks completely black because 
the the labels are encoded as integers and we only have something like uh, 20 classes so there's numbers in there that are sort of distributed between 1 and 20 but most um, most image viewers are expecting an 8-bit image so it's expecting your images your image values to be distributed between 0 and 255 which is why you can't you can barely see it you can actually just about see it uh, if you really squint but obviously if you look at the uh, the the the, the actual images, they'll look like actual images. Uh, with their full, their full dynamic range. Like so. So you can sort of tell like the sorts of imagery that we're working with here. It is a landscape in some respects. It may not be a landscape uh, from any particular de technical definition, but we are sort of looking at landscapes and land covers here. All right. Um, so back down to here. I imagine you might be at a different stage to me, but I'm going to just uh, keep working through this in this way. Um, this is uh, just a piece of code that's going to give me a list of those images. It keeps bouncing back. All right, so I've just made a, a, a list. I've just used the glob, which is a, a function for essentially pattern recognition, um, looking at strings and seeing uh, which fits a particular uh, pattern. The pattern I'm imposing here is, is anything that's got a JPEG extension for an image and anything that's got a PNG extension. And then I'm using, and that comes out as a, as a list, a Python list, so I can use sorted to then sort those images. Um, and that's going to be important to sort them because later on we're actually going to use these two lists and pair them together. Okay. I like to use uh, color maps that mean something to me. Uh, color map, uh, if we just sort of go down here, that's what I mean by color map. I've got my image, my background image that's sort of grayed out, and then I've got a semi-transparent uh, overlay on top of that, which is color-coded every pixel according to class. And I like to use uh, colors that mean something to me. So for example, I've got uh, this light blue for sky, and I've got green for vegetation, I've got gray for roads. In order to, to, to do that, I, used, I use, uh, tend to use this command called listed color map. And I'll just take a list of labels and a list of associated colors. And it will just take those colors and make me a color map that I can then use um, within my matplotlib commands, uh, such as my color bar, and uh, my, 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 my image showing command. These, uh, some of these, you'll see that I deliberately used a mixture of uh, sort of inbuilt colors, um, which are listed here, they're, they're red, green, black, cyan, blue, MATLAB, uh, sorry, magenta and, and yellow, and it's similar to MATLAB uh, in, in those colors. But you can also give it uh, HTML colors as well. And I provided a link here. There's several places that you might look up different colors. So I'll go ahead and load these in. And what it's doing here is just showing you, it's just sort of recreating this, this image here. I've just chosen this particular image, image 1000, because it had a few of those classes and it was showing something interesting. Um, but go, feel free to actually change that number and, and, and explore a few others. Um, here I'm just, uh, this, is a, this, this is a raw, here is my image, and label is my, is my label. And uh, I just got kicked off by runtime, odd. That's, I guess, one downside of using Google Colab is that they really can kick you off at any time. Um, so anyway, the, what I'm showing you here is the image that I'm using a grayscale color map just to make that gray. And then I'm using my own color map that I defined up here. Um, and I'm using an alpha of 0.5, which says, give me, a, give me plot this with a 50% transparency. Uh, and then I have to give it my, my minimums and maximums here because not all classes may be represented in every image, but I want to ensure that every color scale is scaled exactly the same way. So my color bar and my colors, my colors show um, as they should. And so what I've done here is just, I've just done exactly the same, uh, but this time I've put it inside a for loop and I'm just giving it um, a, a few different indices of images within my set. So instead of using image 1000, like in the above, I'm, using, I'm, circ I'm cycling through this and I'm using, um, uh, of course, my runtime got disconnected. So I'm gonna have to go back to the start. This is why Google Colab sucks, but it's great for this, for the purposes of uh, teaching. All right. 
So here, um, I'm just unpacking, I'm untiring this again. It doesn't actually matter uh, for the tar command. It's just going to overwrite everything. If you were using a zip command here, it would actually prompt you to say, do you want to overwrite? Um, but because we have the tar board, it doesn't matter. Um, and I'm only going through this again because uh, I got disconnected from my runtime. If you're any doubt what that means, then you should uh, consult the up, up in this corner. It should tell you if you're connected or not. All right. Um, hopefully I don't get disconnected again. So here it's just cycling through a different, a, a bunch of different images and it's making a plot. Uh, and there's a few different images that I sort of cherry picked because they show different things. This is an image where it's just a drone over the sea and um, there's no sea category. So that goes into background or other. You see a lot of, um, a lot of things like this where multi-class segmentation problems are actually very difficult to label by hand if you're trying to to uh, classify every single thing. So often if your classification scheme doesn't have the thing that you're looking at, it will go into a separate class called background or other. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow, uh, what I think about the practice of doing that. I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. But you can see, um, for the most part, you can see that the, the scene is not other, it's uh, something. Uh, we've got large areas of sky, we've got large areas of vegetation, big, big sort of swathes of road, and then other little bits and pieces. Construction here means building. Obstacle, it's difficult to tell really what that means. That's another class in this particular data set, which is a little bit ambiguous. So for example, this is an obstacle. It's a door that's, that's going into somebody's uh, back, back garden, I think. Um, but if you, if you look at these, uh, these data more closely, you'll get a sense of how many of these classes are represented um, in, the, in the data set overall and, and which aren't. And I can tell you that, uh, for example, boats and drones and cars and bikes and people, they're relatively rare in this data set compared to sky, road, vegetation, construction, background, etc. So it's really those classes that we're going to be focusing on um, as we go through this workflow. Okay, so now we have the data set loaded. Um, this, in this particular case, we had a Google Drive link and we had that data all available to us. You might have to get to a, you might have to get your data into some particular, uh, into a way that is amenable to these, to these um, algorithms. And I'll talk um, a little bit while the model's training later on, I'll talk a little bit about the size of imagery um, and how that relates to the size of feature. And if I don't talk enough about that, then please chime in and ask me questions. Okay, so for the purposes of this, uh, for this uh, lesson here, we're gonna be just focusing on vegetation. But this is, a, this is an opportunity for you to sort of, uh, you could change this vegetation with any of the classes that you might be more interested in and you might, want, you might want to play around with some of these classes. I've specifically chosen vegetation um, as the class of interest for this particular clinic because a, this is a clinic that has been attended by ecologists, and so obviously vegetation um, is a pretty uh, uh, generic um, ecological class. Um, but you might be more interested in other things, so I would, you know, I'd, 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 I'd strongly encourage you to play around with these workflows for different classes, and you'll see a different, you'll see definitely see a different response to how well the um, model works for different classes. Um, the second reason why I used vegetation in particular is because vegetation classes are also represented in my other data set, the semantic drone data set that we're gonna transfer this model to later on. So I, want to, I wanted to make sure that I'm choosing one class that actually is represented in both. Um, and what this piece of code here is really, it's just, finding, um, it's just finding the number that's associated with that class. So these classes are arranged in a list of strings and each string is the individual class but they're also ordered in a specific way. And um, when the model is, ch is trying to uh, use that class, or it, the model is using a representat representation of that class, which is an integer. So all of our labels uh, are images that are composed of integers. And in our particular case, all of the number nines in our label data set, they all re refer to pixels that are vegetation and, um, and, and so forth. Okay. This is an important part here. Um, training neural networks, I know we haven't got to neural networks or training yet, but training neural networks often requires feeding um, the model images in 
small batches. Um, there's a couple of different reasons why that's done in that way. Partly, most, um, most deep learning uh, model training happens on GPUs and not CPUs. And GPUs don't have as much memory as your CPUs have, have memory. Your RAM is typically much larger than any um, of your solid state memory on a GPU. The reason why GPUs are used is because they have many, many more cores. And so you can uh, distribute your training much more effectively, much more computationally efficiently. Um, and it, that, what that means, it, what that really translates to is model training times that are reasonable. If you were to train this particular model on a CPU, it might take days, but on a GPU, it takes minutes to hours. And that's the, that, and that's the difference. But a big downside with using GPUs is that you're limited by your, your, by, your, by your image sizes and by your batch sizes. If you're providing um, the model large numbers of very large images, you'll very quickly fill up your GPU memory and you'll get a, and a resources error and it will crash. So you, you're, you're usually faced with two choices. You either have to make your images much smaller than they, than they really are. And I'll talk about that, why that may not necessarily be a problem in, 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 a, minute, in, in a minute. But, but oftentimes you also have to make the number of images that is presented to the model small as well. You can't just feed all of your you know, 2,000, 3,000 images to the, to the model in one go, and you probably wouldn't want to anyway, because another big reason why we train in batches is because it's, a, it's, a, it's another good way to regular, uh, regularize our data, our model. Um, it prevents the model from overfitting your data, essentially. If you're feeding the, Im uh, the images to the model in batches, it learns from those batches alone, um, it goes through the process of setting its weights based on those batches. But there might be other things that you do um, to those batches that help with model regularization as well. Um, for example, you might scale those batches in slightly different ways, um, present those different uh, versions of your batches to the model uh, in order to give it um, much more variability. So it has to work harder to learn the general trends from the data and not just memorizing the patterns within the data. So that's essentially why we use batches. I'm going to stop here real quick and see if I have any uh, comments on the chat. Uh, but feel free to ask any questions if you have them. Actually, I don't see my chat. What is that? It's next to participants uh, on their lower, lower bar. So Sometimes when you're sharing your screen, you have to press other on the right side of the bottom of the zoom bar, and that's where your chat will appear. Oh, yeah, I'm not seeing any either of those. Um, or with, click escape, maybe? Sorry? Oh, here we go, chat. Okay, doesn't look like anyone's chatting. Has anyone put a chat, has anyone put a comment in the chat that they know of? Yeah, there some, I think there are some comments in the chat um mine says like what tools do you recommend for labeling images in the beginning why test data is blank black hmm. i'm having a few issues with this is i'm using um the zoom on linux and i think the everything's in maybe a slightly different place um the, i unfortunately i don't see my chat so if anyone would like to re-ask that question that would be that would be fine and now would be a good time Go ahead, Sarah. You did an awesome job, I think. Can you? Oh, th so these are not my questions, but what um, it looks like Robert posted, um, what tools do you recommend for labeling images? Okay, um, that's a good question. I recommend, I currently recommend a website that's called makesense.ai. This is Really cool for a couple of different reasons. Partly it's open source. You can actually download this from its GitHub page and run it locally. Um, or you can run it through the URL that's made available here. But it doesn't store any of your data, which is important for a lot of folks who work for agencies. Um, it, it, it's just facilitating you to upload your data so you can download your labels. And then as soon as your session is over, you can 
be basically um, um, assured that your data is not gone off to some weird place. So you essentially drop your images in here. Um, I don't know if I have one. Maybe I have one in here somewhere. Um, no, I don't. Uh, sorry, I wasn't prepared for that. The uh, you essentially just drop an image in there and you start labeling. I should actually just show you that here. I've got, um, I do have imagery, obviously. Let me, let me throw one of these error escapes one in just to make it relevant to what we're doing here. Um, so I've, I've uploaded an image. Um, I want to create some labels. Let's say I want vegetation. Uh, let's say I want water and sky. Or you can load labels from a file. Here it's actually saying that it's going to try to actually estimate uh, those things for you. Uh, oftentimes it doesn't work unless you're working with things that are really specific, uh, like people. Um, so oftentimes you'll say, I'm going on my own. And then you, you basically use this tool if you're. Uh, You've got a couple of different ways to interact with this tool. Uh, you've got bounding boxes. So bounding boxes are just squares. Um, you've got points. So points are sort of just as they say, they're points. You select your label, oh sorry, you select your label like this. Um, so it just labels those. But what we're talking about is a segmentation. So what you need is polygon. So this polygon class here allow you to essentially um, you know, segment out your your features. You can sort of do this fairly efficiently. I'm using a terrible mouse for this, and I'm also don't have any time. So you know, let's say that that's a good one there. You would say, okay, that's vegetation. And then one, once you've done that for a whole bunch of images, you can go to export and you export your polygons as a VGG format file. So that's that's a good one. I would recommend that um, for generating your data set. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. All right, so um, assuming no more people have questions, uh, apologies for this chat thing. I, I did see it when I wasn't sharing my screen and then as soon as it, uh, as soon as I shared my screen, the chat went away. Uh, okay. Dan? Yeah. If you go up to the top of your screen and where it says you're sharing your screen, move the mouse up above that and all the options should come down from Zoom. Ah. And then, and then there's a, the chat is in the three dots to the right. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. That's awesome. And then that'll open chat. All right. Thanks, Chad. Yep. Appreciate that so much. No problem. Okay. Um, yes, the class is being recorded. Thank you for the website. Um, we've looked at labeling. There, there's lots of labeling tools out there. A quick Google search would, would give you an alternative. I've, I've, I've researched a few of them and makesense.ai is the one that I like. So I'm going to just type that in to the chat so everyone has it. Yep, segmentation these polygons. You can do that with makesense.ai. All right. So keep the chat coming and I'll come back to your questions in, in a few minutes. So this, this is a, so let's go back, go back to the batches. So this is a custom batch generator. Um, Keras has its own uh, ways to generate batches, a uh, number of different ways. Um, but this is one I like because it's sort of intuitive. You can sort of see what it's doing under the hood. But also um, this, there might be many ways in which you might need to do things to your imagery, um, such as what we're doing here. Uh, you might need to, for example, um, pair up images in this sort of way where I've just taken my file, which is inherited from this, this loop here, which is just one of these files here that's randomly sort of selected from my catalog. That then uh, goes into this for loop, and that's what F is. It's just a, it's just a string of one file name. So it's very convenient for this particular data set. Um, you know, if you want to just sort of find the, the label that's associated with every image, then really uh, it's, it's, it's a question of finding the file and just sort of 
replacing it in this case in this case is very convenient to just replace that file name with a different extension and then a different folder because the images are arranged in such a way that they are uh, they're just numbers and so uh, 0001.png is the label of 001.jpg in the other folder so it allows you to do things like that it also allows you to um Apologies, that keeps on jumping every time I open that file browser, so I'm probably not going to do that again. Um, it also allows me in this specific case to say, okay, this is a, a label that contains the, uh, the labels from all of my classes, but I'm only interested in vegetation. So we generated that number nine earlier on specifically for the purposes of giving it to this function. So we could say, okay, we can read in our mask, which is our label image, but in the end, our mask is really only those pixels that are that number. And everything else we're gonna call zero. So this mask is actually a binary mask uh, consisting of two numbers, zero and one, zero for all of the background class pixels and one for all of the vegetation pixels. And so that's why I've set this up in such a way. But I think you'll also find, I think for a generic workflow, it's useful to be exposed to this type of thing because you don't see this as much in a lot of online tutorials for TensorFlow. They tend to go straight to their inbuilt functions, which don't tend to work uh, for every, every case. Okay, so that's what that function does. And so now we're gonna use it. Um, we're going to use relatively small batches. Uh, we're going to use a uh, batch size of eight. So that means we're going to present to the model um, during every training epoch, we're going to give it uh, eight images and eight associated labels. The size of the imagery we're going to use is going to be smaller than the original imagery. Um, 720 by 720, I think it was what the original size was. Um, I just made that um, slightly smaller so it fits on the GPU memory but you could use the original size if you had enough memory on your GPU. I think for the purposes of this we'll run with the slightly smaller size. Uh, the other reason why I've used the smaller size is because that's sort of typical, uh, that's more typical I guess than not I think for a lot of the, of the data sets that you might be using. Um, even though you you tend to go out and spend a lot of effort and creating very, very high resolution imagery because you might be sort of maybe piping that into other workflows such as photogrammetry or whatever that requires a lot of uh, resolution. Typically with neural network training, you're actually making uh, degraded copies of your images uh, and feeding them to the, to, to the, to the model. Um, in degraded in our case because we're making the spatial resolution slightly smaller. But then the, the image obviously undergoes um, a lot of random transformations and we'll see what that means. Uh, you know, that, that image is, is essentially treated, it's, it's squished and it's squashed and it's, it's, it features are extracted from it and there's not a lot of preservation of spatial, uh, of, of any type of spatial relations in them. Um, but there's specific ways in which convolutional neural work, networks do uh, to keep track of that spatial information and we'll talk about that. But, but in general, um, you're giving it square images. Most models that you'll see out there sort of take square images and not, um, and not, uh, not rectangular. Obviously most images are rectangular. So you're not preserving the aspect ratio of every pixel, but it, in the end, it probably doesn't matter that much. Um, what we're hoping here is that the, the, the model is able to extract features that relate to vegetation. And vegetation, as we all probably all know, is somewhat self-similar. It's sort of kind of fractal in its structure. You know, you have a lot of repeating patterns. There's a lot of image stationarity involved with vegetation. So for this particular class, it's not going to matter a hell of a lot if we, if we make the images a bit smaller or even if we, uh, if we squash the shape, uh, change the shape of those pixels because, um, because of the specific way in which the image is going to be extracting those features is not going to be too sensitive to those things. But it is possible that you may encounter other situations where you do need to preserve the aspect ratio of the pixel. Um, but I would, probably, I would probably suggest that those are relatively rare. Okay, so we're using, a, we're using this function now. We've just called that function. This is a generator function, which is a very specific uh, Python construct that allows you to uh, sort of query uh, the function on the fly. Most functions are sort of x equals function y, and x is returned as a function of y, and it's all done at one time. TensorFlow is sort of set up in such a way that 
the com all of the computations are done only when they're needed. And that's sort of the whole point of TensorFlow and why it's so useful and so computationally efficient. Um, but then also, you know, generators, they, do, they work along the same principle. Generators are used a, a lot within machine learning because um, of memory limitations. You just want to provide uh, the, the next batch of images to the algorithm when it's needed by the model. And so internally, what the model is doing every time it, uh, it goes into, an, in, uh, it, it searches for a new batch of images, is just calling a next command on a generator. And so next is the, is the sister of yield. So we go back to our generator, any function that you see that's end, it, that ends with yield is a generator function that's interrogated using a next command. So we use next to get the next batch of images. And so that will be, if we, if we expand this a bit, the length of X will be eight and the length of Y will be eight because eight is what we asked for. Okay, so if we plot those, this time I'm, um, I'm just plotting just the image in the background and then the, the generated label. So it's sort of working in a similar way. I'm going through a, a number of these images and I'm just uh, taking that label. And what I'm doing is just color coding uh, all of the ones in the label by green and then all of the zeros, they become white. So it, very quickly you can see that that's working because it's uh, the, the green pixels are overlaying what, you, what your eyes tell you is vegetation. Okay, so we're building the model now. Um, we're getting to the point where we're importing TensorFlow layers. Um, we, we're at the point where we can build the model because we have this generator function. We have all of our imagery all, all ready to go. The, this is the format essentially that we're feeding the model. We're just giving it these batches of X's and Y's. Um, these model layers, I'm gonna talk about a little bit uh, during the model training um, because the model training will take a few minutes. Um, so I'll come back to a few of these, but you'll see that the things, uh, th it's, it's all organized um, as either callbacks, layers, or models. They're the three major Keras workflow um, components. And at this juncture, I just remembered that I hadn't actually mentioned Keras yet. So TensorFlow is our, is our library um, that we're essentially using uh, to do the heavy lifting on our, on our deep model, uh, sorry, our deep learning model. That is uh, essentially C++ code that's very highly optimized for distributed computing. Um, sending, um, sending graphs um, off to different uh, parts of your computer hardware and telling that gra and, and the graph tells that piece of hardware what to do just for an instant in time and what to return. And so it's a very efficient way to do distributed computing because things happen on the fly. Keras, um, Keras is a way is a higher level wrapper to the TensorFlow uh, API that is able to uh, make it a lot easier for us to use TensorFlow API functionality. Keras is also really cool because it interfaces with a number of other different um, deep learning, low level deep learning sort of uh, libraries out there. And you may have heard of Theano and you may have heard of the uh, Microsoft one that I always forget, CMDK or something like that. I've never actually used that one, but it interfaces with all three. It doesn't interface, uh, it doesn't currently interface with another deep learning framework that you may have heard of out there called PyTorch. PyTorch is very powerful and very cool, but we're not using it for the purposes of this uh, tutorial. Um, it's, TensorFlow is more common within industry uh, and it's more common in general. PyTorch is generally more common among uh, computer science researchers people actively engaged in machine vision research and things like that. That's not to say that it's not incredibly powerful and useful for everyone else, but you just have to make a choice because Keras doesn't, uh, because Keras essentially is, is pretty, pretty good to use and TensorFlow sort of comes with, with, uh, with its own version of Keras. And so that's, that's sort of the workflow that I've adopted. Okay, um, I brushed over this little part here about actually making the model, and I did that for a reason. Uh, all of these commands essentially are these, all of these commands here are just sub functions that are called on by this main command. This is a, a ver this is a model that is um, not my own original design, but I have he sort of heavily modified it for the purposes of this, uh, for this particular workflow. Uh, just a couple of modifications um, I made that I'll, I will talk about in a minute. Um, but these are, this, is, this is the entire block of code that deals with your big, your big model 
um, that's going to do all of these fancy things. And it's pretty cool that um, it's that accessible, I think, that you know you can, even though it may look like complicated Python code, it's really not that bad, um, especially considering the, the complexity of the thing that that code is actually doing. Um, OK, so th this is where I want to talk a little bit about um, class imbalance. But before I go there, uh, anyone has any questions while I consult the chat? OK, so one question from Julia. Oh, no, I, I, I skipped Kerry. Kerry says, how many images do you need to label before you start? It's a really good question um, that doesn't have an answer. And I think we'll revisit that maybe later on. There's, the short answer is it's really, it really does depend on your data. And it depends on the, on the model, too. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that question from the perspective of this particular data set. Um, and I'll also talk about it from the perspective of the other data set. And get, again, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. So hopefully, hopefully you get enough pointers um, about that particular topic um, as I go. But please ask me more specific questions if you have them. Do you need to label background um, or just the class of interest? If you're using makesense.ai, you can just label the class of interest because everything else would be the background. Um, Background is it can be dangerous territory though if you if that background class has something very very similar to the thing that you are interested in. Is there a way to partition the class balance? Um, yes, class balance. That's about what, that's what I'm about to talk about right now. Um, and then, do images have to be fully classified wall to wall? Um, not necessarily. There's going to. I'm going to introduce you a workflow tomorrow that might help with that. Um, wall to wall. I think. What, I think what you mean by that is, do you need to label the entire image? And uh, the answer is not necessarily, because anything you don't label will fall into a background class. Um, David says, guessing this is model endemic, better to have more images label or fewer images with more precise labels. Again, that's a pretty difficult, yes, I, I see the motivation behind that question, but I, it's a pretty difficult question to answer generically because it really does depend on your data. My experience is that you, if you have precise labels, then you know that your error is due to your model and not your imprecise labeling. But I'm, I've also got ways to um, refine my labels based on other workflows. Is it easy to expend, extend the multispectral images? Absolutely. Um, yes, we, we will get to that tomorrow. So the, the reason why it's extensible is because we've essentially written the code ourselves, And so we can, add, um, we can add functionality to that code in order to make it deal with that extra dimension or multiple dimensions. Um, it's not particularly common among, um, especially amongst the computer science type literature that you might be exposed to, you know, the, the maybe popular science articles or blog posts that deal with how to do image segmentation. They almost always work with RGB images and they almost always work with sort of um, sort of existing data sets out there that have been curated for the purposes of method development, not for sort of application development. So, and especially in the terms of natural sciences. Um, so there are relatively few examples of those out there, but I can tell you that they definitely do exist. There's many, many, many uh, remote sensors who are obviously actively engaged in application of deep learning. And a lot of their data might be geophysical, uh, it might be multispectral or hyperspectral. All right, um, I'm going to just un I'm going to minimize that chat just for a minute, uh, but keep keep the questions coming. They're great. Hopefully, I'm doing an okay, okay job answering them. Um, some of them are quite difficult to answer because I'm either I'm either going to cover it later on or because um, I haven't yet exposed you to enough things to really make the answer understandable. So I've just um, just ask you to have a little bit of patience and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to a couple of those questions. Um, but one question was about class imbalance. Yes, that's a big problem. Um, class imbalance basically means that you have uh, many, many, many more examples of one class versus another class. Um, in our case, that means that we, we, would, we would almost always have more background pixels. We'd have more zeros in our label image uh, than we have cl the class of interest, the ones. 
So if you, if you were to look at a histogram of the frequency of zeros and ones, um, they might, you know, sorry, it might actually be like that. You have got a lot of zeros and very few ones. That is often a very big problem for uh, deep learning uh, algorithms, um, but it's only a problem because of misspecification of a loss function. So a loss function is the thing that is actually doing the work in terms of it's the thing that the model is keeping track of in order to adjust its weights um, to come up with an optimal solution. The, the loss itself is just the, uh, is, a, is a number that you're essentially trying to minimize. This is an optimization problem. It's a minimization problem. You're trying to find the minimum of a function, essentially. And your neural network is the thing that is finding that minimum. Uh, it's, it's set up to do so because of its architecture rather than any specific uh, optimization scheme. But then there's optimization schemes involved as well. The optimizer, the actual thing that is doing the optimization. We'll talk a bit about that, but what that thing is doing is minimizing a loss. And our loss is the thing that we need to pay most attention to for classed imbalance problems. Because the loss function is really the thing that's reporting back to the model about how the model is doing. And if the, mos if the loss function is biased uh, towards any particular class, then that's obviously, uh, a, we have a big problem. Um, I do have, so, as I will just sort of footnote that by saying that I've got a, a larger version of this uh, tutorial that doesn't fit in two days that I'm going to post online that uses a different data set. And it explores some of this stuff in a bit more detail. It looks at, um, at, at optimizing um, a particular, uh, this model, but optimizing it using different training strategies uh, to come up with the best way. And it sort of does that step by step. And I've hopefully put it together in such a way that convinces you that certain loss functions are really bad for class imbalance problems and that other loss functions actually get around that problem. Um, I'm talking about loss functions here because that is what I'm about to say, but also another way to get around class imbalance is obviously by treating labels. Um, if, you have, um, if you have, if you're labeling imagery, in such a way that the labels, <laughs> the, sorry, that the classes have about equal representation among, uh, among the data set, then obviously that doesn't, that's not a problem anymore. Um, we're only talking about cases where there's really a huge difference between, uh, between the different classes. So um, one particular function that's really good for these binary uh, segmentations in general um, is called, it's called the dice uh, coefficient or the dice loss. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to um, deal with binary segmentations because that's essentially what it was set up to do, but it's also a good way to deal with uh, this class imbalance problem. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that tomorrow as well. Um, but for now, we, we will sort of take it that uh, on an article of faith that this is a good uh, dice a dice loss is going to be good for us. It's very similar to um, a metric called the Jacquard in, in the index or intersection over union, which looks at uh, the intersection um, of two polygons and their union, which tells you how the, to what degree they have overlap. The problem with uh, with the IOU score is that it tends to but the, uh, it tends to result in biases towards the class that is more dominant in the data set. So in our case, that would be the background class. So um, it, it, the dice loss is a, is a subtle variation of the IOU score that um, essentially uh, it weights things the same to, irrespective of their size, which is what we need in this particular case. Okay, and this is the IOU score here, and I'm going to define it here just so you can see it, but also We'll keep track of it as we compile the model because it'd be useful to see how these two uh, relate. Okay, so we've defined um, our batch function now. Um, we've got a, a function that will make our model um, and we've defined our loss function. So now we're in the position of actually making the model and then compiling the model. So um, compiling doesn't actually mean, in the, in the sense of if you were co to compile code, you're turning it into zeros and ones so it can be interpreted by a machine. You're sort of doing that here as well, but you, you're, it, the, the, the main thing about it is that you have to, spe you have to specify certain things that it needs in order to, uh, to function. Um, you have to give it an optimizer. Um, so the optimizer is the thing that's actually, uh, is the, 
is the is the algorithm that's essentially minimizing the function. It's doing uh, the stochastic gradient descent uh, function. Uh, it's working out the, the stochastic gradient descent. There's a number of different uh, optimizers that you might use in this situation. Um, another really good one for these types of problem is called Adam. So Adam um, is basically the same as RMS prop, but it has the, uh, this thing called momentum behind it. It's just a, it's just, it's a numerical um, uh, sort of construct that uh, allows it to interrogate portions of your parameter space a little bit more effectively. Um, but it's not always the, you see it a lot, um, the Adam and you see RS, RMS prop, you see them sort of used interchangeably oftentimes. They, they do different things, but they often result in similar uh, results. And here I'm giving my, lo my loss function. That's actually my function I'm giving it there. That's not a particular variable or that has a numeric, uh, it's, a, it's a function. And similarly, this is a function. My dice coefficient is a function and my mean IOU is a function. You can specify as many metrics as you like. The, the metrics are things that it computes at the end of every training epoch. Um, it's just a, a way to report back um, how well the model is doing. Typically, it's, diff it's using the validation set. We haven't got to the test and validation sets yet. Um, and uh, the loss is the thing that's actually being used by the model to set the weights. And to, it's the thing that defines how the backpropagation algorithm is going to go, how the weights are going to get propagated back through the network um, so the model can start training again. Um, so these things, these metrics don't actually contribute to the model training. They're just, they're just things that you're reporting back um, to, to see how well you're doing as you, as you go. These models take a very long time to train. So if the if you if you're monitoring your metrics as they train, you can actually just stop it if you think that it's not going to work out. You can develop a sense for that. Um, this is I'm putting these these couple of things in here because they're they're not necessarily to our, uh, necessary to our workflow workflow, but they are kind of useful. Um, this is a way to save your model out as a JSON file. Uh, it's a metadata format. Um, a human readable ASCII format that you can sort of see how your model is put together, but it also allows you to sort of read it back in. Um, all, all of these things up here are Python objects, and so they require a lot of work to sort of decon like sort of pack them out into things that you can actually see. Um, but this model to JSON is a pretty useful thing that Keras has inbuilt. So if you need to give your model to someone else, that's a good way to do it. This function here here is um, oops I haven't of course I haven't actually been running any of these cells. Uh, what was the last one I ran? Okay, so I need to run that one and then run these two. And you'll see um, once this compiles over here, you'll see or if it ever does, you'll see. Um, okay, may have just done it. So you go over here and refresh. You'll see that you've got a new file model.json. Have a look at that. And you've got this model.png, uh, which is uh, this thing here that's also been printed to the screen. And what you're looking at here is this is what the this is what the model actually looks like. These deep neural networks are just layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of things. The the outputs of one layer, the inputs to the next, and on you go. Um, a lot of modern uh, sort of hypermodern neural networks have these uh, these different branches, these skip connections they're called. Uh, they, they happen at various scales and they're for various reasons. I'm not going to go too much into it, but the, the idea is that you sort of, you take your inputs and you, you treat them one way and you treat them another way and then you combine their, their you sort of add them, you combine them together. Uh, so you've got one sort of path along this that's extracting maybe one type of feature and then another path that's doing something different and they get added together and so forth and so forth and these models are, are large they, they consist of many many layers like this and all of these skip connections can be quite uh, confusing there's a reason why these skip connections uh, are there and i'll talk about that while the model is training okay so this is the point where if you go ahead and just run these cells um this is the point we're actually downloading this data that I've got um, up on the web, but this time we're we're downloading just text files that um, I've already uh, I've I've already gone through the process of randomly uh, splitting the data into three different subsets. We've got a training set, 
a validation set and a testing set. And the reason why I've put them out on, uh, I've, I've exported them out to file is because I want you to read them back in so we see similar things. If we were to use different random subsets of the data, especially because we're training our models over very few numbers of epochs, uh, of, of epochs, then the, um, we, would, we would potentially see different things. So this is, just, this is just for the purposes of this particular lesson. We're just reading that back in from, you know, from our Google Drive. And this bit of code here, uh, the details don't matter too much, but essentially it's just opening a file and then just reading them in line by line. And then this last little bit here is just printing to screen how many uh, different um, numbers of, of images that we have in each set. And you'll see that I've got more training files than I have testing files and validation files, and that's pretty typical. You need to present neural networks with a lot of information in order for them to perform optimally. Um, going back to the question, the first time I'm going to go back to the question about how much data we need. Well, hundreds, ideally, <laughs> typically, um, but not necessarily. And it does depend on your data. This data set here has obviously thousands, a couple of thousand. Um, that's a pretty good number, but it obviously takes a very long time to, to manually label that number of images. Um, so you, you typically start small, you make a model, you see how it well performs, you get a sense for how well it might perform with more data, and then you sort of act accordingly until a point where you've, you've fed it more data and the model hasn't performed uh, even, even better, at which point that's a, it's a, it, that's the brute force way of knowing that you're that you're done, um, but there's more sophisticated ways too that we'll, we are going to talk about as as we go. Um, okay, so this this bit of code here is just commented out because that's just showing you how I made those different subsets. So I I just I took um, half of the image uh, set and then I took half of the next set and then half of the next set. So I have 50, 20, 25 split. And here, this is just a piece of code that I use to write those files out, if you, if you find that useful. All right, so before we go on to training the model, uh, I'll have a quick look here at the questions. Will the extensive tutorial be posted online uh, free to access? Yes, it will, uh, when it's finished. Uh, almost finished it. That was my goal for the end of the week. Um, and I'm going to announce it to the same list, the same email list um, as here, and I'll give it to system to announce as well. Um, is that diagram for one part of the training? Yes, that is. Yeah, that's the model. And the, the data goes through this model many, many, many times. The number of times uh, is the number of epochs, the training epochs. Um, so if you have 100 epochs, then it will, all of your data will go through this entire model 100 times. It does so in batches. Um, so if you have a thousand images and your batch size is 10, then obviously you're, pa you're passing uh, it's sort of a hundred batches through, the, through, every, uh, through this model on every epoch, and then you're doing that epoch number of times, if that makes sense. And we'll see that in action now as, as, as we train the model. Okay, um, this is uh, another piece that's sort of custom to this particular workflow. Um, this isn't necessarily what you'll always see in tutorials that uh, introduce you to these topics. But again, it's useful to have uh, exposure to some of these uh, relatively rare things because again, it's something that you will probably encounter if you're doing this for real on your data. Um, this particular um, class that I've defined here is a couple of different uh, functions within it. One, it, all it does really is that here, when they, uh, at the beginning of every training epoch, it will just initialize uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of empty lists and a counter. And then what it does at the end of a training epoch, it will use the current state of the model uh, to predict. So this, the model, uh, when it comes to this point, is here. And we're using it, it's being actively trained as we speak, but it's an object, it's a Python object. So you can sort of interrupt its training real quick to make a prediction. And we're predicting on one of the test sets, uh, one of the validation files. And that reminds me, I didn't actually talk to you about what these different sets are. So if we go back to this, so we've got these three different sets here. Uh, the training files, they're the file, they're the images that are randomly drawn from the catalog that the model is gonna see. Uh, the validation files, they're the files that are also given to the model 
uh, to to use to predict on. So, for example, in that in that plotting thing that I just showed you there, that's a that's one of the validation files that it's drawing um, when uh, in that in that in that sense. But it's also the the set of files that it's using to define these metrics. So we go back up to the top. We have these two metrics. Um, it's going to be using the validation set to define those two metrics. And so it, it's, it's important that we use the validation set because those are the images that have not been seen by the model. They've been touched by the model in the sense that they, we're using them for prediction, we're using them to define metrics that we keep track of during training, but they're not, they're not the things that are actually uh, used by the bank propagation algorithm to set the weights. Um, so these metrics here, which is also why I've got two of them, um, because you know I can have as list as, as many uh, metrics as I like there, and it will just get essentially printed to screen and, and recorded, so you can have a look at them later on. Then finally, that we've got the testing set, which is a set of files that I like to keep aside for the purposes of just testing. The validation set, you know, if your model is good enough, uh, it's generalized, it, it's figured out. Um, what things look like in general and how to extract them from your imagery. Um, so for vegetation, for example, it's figured out this sort of fuzziness and it's figured out uh, the fractalness about it. It's figured out the, the, what features it actually needs to extract to make that call. Um, and then on the test set, you're actually seeing if it, if it did a pretty good job. So you know, in many senses, you'll see training and, uh, sorry, you'll see test and validation sort of used interchangeably. But specifically here, validation is going to be given to the model during training, but not used um, for the purposes of training, just for reporting metrics. And then test files, we're not going to see until the end. Um, once we have a model that we think is done, uh, it's trained sufficiently, then, um, then we're, that's where the test set come in. So this callback function, it's called a callback function, um, and it's given this sort of uh, piece of code in here, which basically just tells the model that this is a callback function and that um, we're going to be using the Keras callback sort of um, framework in order to execute this function. Um, and then what it's doing, and then all of this piece of code here is just updating those things that got allocated at the start. Um, so we can give, we can basically carry uh, all of these variables through self, which is the 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 self of the of the program. It it's uh, a way basically to to move variables in Python internally, um, and it will take a ran random dot choice. It takes a random random file from our validation set. It opens the file, it resizes it to what we need it to be, it makes a prediction. This uh, expand dims, that's just because it's, uh, it, it comes in as, as, a, as, a, as a matrix and we need to turn it into a tensor in order to use it within TensorFlow. Um, and so that just, in this case, that's just uh, adding a, 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 another dimension to it. And then it makes a prediction based on that form of the data. And then in the end, it squeezes that data uh, to remove any singleton dimensions. And so if you're, if you're a MATLAB coder, you'll understand what squeeze is already, or if you're a Python coder, you'll probably know as well. Um, and then this little part, this little part here just uh, takes that prediction and turns it into, into, a, into an image um, that we can then see during model training. The, um, it makes a prediction. Any, in this case, uh, anything that's greater than 0 0.5, we're going to call 1. I'll go back to that. Here, I'm turning this into an 8-bit image just by, uh, by stacking it in three dimensions and then timesing that whole thing by 255. And the reason for that is because, in the end, I just want to show this combined image, which is going to be the image itself, the mask, and then the image masked by the mask, all in one image that then gets plotted during this command here. Probably more detail than you needed, but there you go. Um, so we're actually, we're not going to train this uh, model for very long because obviously we don't have time to sit here and watch it spin, but um, we are going to train it a little bit. We're just going to do five uh, epochs. Here I'm just making a, a, a function that um, is going to allow me to, to save uh, the, mod, the, cu the current best state of the model as I go. Um, so this is what it's called a checkpoint. I guess it's called a checkpoint because you can always go back to it. Uh, it's pretty crucial that that you, know, that you do that, um, that you save your, your, your checkpoints as you go because especially if you're working on Google Colab, anything can go wrong. Uh, you can get randomly disconnected. Maybe a few of you already have. Um, and obviously, uh, 
if you're running this on a computer, you could run into issues as well. It's just a good idea to keep check of those as you go. But uh, if you save uh, save weights, uh, save best only equals true, it will only save the best weights. That's That means it will only save the weights out to disk again if the models made an actual improvement based on the validation loss. And that is what I'm being, I'm telling it here to monitor the validation loss because it's the validation set that I'm more interested in. These models are extremely good at fitting to the training data set. That's not what you're paying attention to necessarily. You're paying attention to how well it does on the, the data that it's not ever seen because obviously that's a much better indication that it's going to work for your problem. So that's what that means. And then I'm just adding that checkpoint uh, object to this plot learning, which is the class that I just defined above. Um, and then returning this as a thing that I can then pass to the model, which is essentially just a list of callback functions. Here, I'm um, the file path. That's just going to be uh, this is the the file path that's the the the, the model results or the model weights are going to be uh, saved to. The the model itself um, is the architecture and the weights, and we have the we already have the architecture. We have a way to reproduce the creation of that but we don't have a, a way to, to store the weights yet. And so this is what we're using for that. It's an H5 format file, HDF5. Um, it's sort of somewhat similar to things like NetCDF. It's a, it's a portable human, uh, not human readable, but um, has a, has a, it's a good format. <laughs> um, it's also the format that Keras uses. This is our training generator. So I'm using my image batch generator here to make a generator that's going to interrogate just the training files, just call those uh, for training. I'm also going to pass my model a validation generator that's going to use the validation files. The class num there is nine. That corresponds to vegetation um, that we set earlier on. The size is 512 by 512 and the batch size is eight. So the number, so the, um, as I said earlier on, uh, the, all of that data is presented to the model at each training epoch. Uh, but it does so in, in steps, uh, and the number of steps is basically just the number of files divided by the size of the batch. So there'll be 204 training steps. That means the, uh, there'll be 204 times that the model is fed eight images and eight labels during every training epoch. And so you can see that this is, we're talking about massive computation here. We're talking about um, things that really do need to uh, harness uh, better hardware like uh, big GPUs, uh, many, many cores, and things like that. This isn't necessarily something you want to do on a laptop, um, but obviously it is possible, especially for smaller data sets um, and for relatively small training times. All right, so I've already defined the model. I've got now my, I've got everything I need to start training my model. I'll explain what this means later on, but let's go ahead and just get that going because it's 125 and um, this is there's basically now training on this cloud computer. Hopefully, maybe yours has already finished training. Um, but I'm going to stop here and see if there are any questions before I start backfilling some of the details that I've skipped over so far. And, and if anyone has any questions that they'd like to use their voice to communicate, that would also be great. Um, I, I'd also obviously want to know if I'm going too fast or too complicated. Hi, Dan, and this is Chris. In, in this line where you're um, generating the, the, um, the test data and the validation data, what keeps you from getting the same data in both sets? Oh, because they're interrogating two separate lists of files. So this, this validation files here, was given to my train my validation generator, and then my training files were given to my training generator. And then when I specified the model here, I said, um, "So train generator, that's that's always going to be what it expects first. That's the data that it's going to be training on. That could also be a list of files. So in this case, if I were to copy this and just paste it in here, um, if you were to sort of do this on an entire." data set without using batches, you could, you could just do that. You could just give it the entire set, um, but it's not necessarily the optimal way to do it. And similarly, it, and similarly you, could, you could stick that in there. 
you'll see that too in some um, in some uh, tutorials. Not every tutorial you'll see uses generators. We tend to we tend to use generators because we tend to have large data sets and things like that. Okay, so we've got, oh good, I'm glad that you're finding the pace okay. Um, when you have a class that, like vegetation that exhibits a fractal nature, how do you go about choosing the resolution to use for training? Uh, I guess this all depends on the cores you have and the time, but in general, how would you choose? Yeah, um, in many respects, you, like many things, you develop an intuition for what might work and what might not work just based on what you've seen working, what you haven't seen working. Things like vegetation are just so different from other classes in this particular data set. Um, there's a lot of self-similarity in our imagery in general, but the specific way that vegetation sort of structure, the shadows, the, you know, the alternation, the, the spatial scales associated with the alternation of the bright and the dark, they are very different than others. You can use um, many other techniques to query your data to see how well different uh, classes might fall out from an unsupervised classification. So for example, you could use um, lots of different types of clustering techniques to see how well um, you know, different classes within your data set do cluster out in space. And you can do that with your training and your, with your training data set. You, you do that with your set of images and the set of corresponding labels. Um, it's a different workflow than obviously what I'm presenting here, but that is a good way to do it, I think. But, but generally, um, it's a, a lot of this stuff involves a lot of experimentation in general. Like, you know, when I approach uh, a particular task, I'll take a model that I think might work okay, but really what I'm doing is 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 playing with my data to see what what works best with uh, with my data. Like, you know, I I I will downsize my imagery to a point, and if it's if I think it's too blurry or too fuzzy, then obviously it's no good. I have to split that up. Another thing that I didn't mention was that because we have we had we had square imagery to to work with in this. Uh, uh, from the start. So it wasn't a too much of a big deal to actually like just downsize that. Um, but if you had la very large rectangular images, then you're probably better off chopping that image up into smaller square chunks and then doing the labels on those. It's going to be quicker, more efficient to label perhaps, but, but more, more importantly, it's going, to be, um, it's going to be more amenable to a workflow like this. If you have, um, you know, very poorly resolved data, like, you know, land on, not poorly resolved, but relatively poorly resolved, like Landsat or whatever, you know, 20 meter or 10 meter style footprints, then, then obviously, you know, you don't want to be downsizing your imagery uh, even further. Your, your model is already downsizing your image probably more than you're comfortable with. Um, so you want to try and keep that, that input data that it's uh, as about as uh, uh, close to its native resolution as, as you can. Uh, but going back to sort of the fractal nature of stuff, I just meant that in terms of vegetation, because I know that vegetation has a fractal structure. I don't know about the fractal structure of any other classes, so I can't really I can't make comments about that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a, uh, can you speak to the effect of kernel size in the convolution block, bottleneck block, and the res block functions? Yes, I'm about to do that. Um, does TensorFlow have functions that could, and could the model framework you built be adapted for panoptic segmentation? Um, there's okay so to back up there's many 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 different types of segmentation out there S so there's instance segmentation where you are not only um, not only segmenting that class but also I, uh, giving them a unique identifier panoptic segmentation I'd have to be reminded of what that is I've definitely come across that term but it's escaping me at the moment so if you can let me know what that is, maybe I can answer that question better. But in general, yeah, TensorFlow has functions that you could do panoptic segmentation with for sure. And instance segmentation. Those models tend to be a lot more complicated though. So they're not necessarily in entry level models. They might, might be things that you progress to after you've discovered that a more simple workflow doesn't work well. And we're jumping to, you know, a unit is a fairly, um, is a fairly, uh, standard sort of way to do things is a very, very big 
deep model. It has almost 700,000 parameters or whatever, but in this particular case, but um, there are other models out there that have, you know, tens of millions of parameters that are generally um, more powerful, but not necessarily easier to work with. Um, sounds like, okay, so panoptic segmentation, it could be similar to instant segmentation, but yeah, there'll be Keras workflows for that for sure. Uh, Zoltan said, if you chopped up large images into small squares, you get edge effects when you predict classes on a uh, large image, quite possibly, but there would be post-processing workflows that I'm going to show you tomorrow that would expl explicitly deal with that. So if you can stay tuned tomorrow, we can talk about that then. All right, so going back to, uh, if no one has any other questions, I'll talk a little bit about what this model is actually doing, what convolution neural, <laughs> neural networks really are, and some of these details that I skipped over before. All right, so um, well, uh, one more question. What about classifying features from elevation data? Absolutely, that's possible, yes. It's, it works in a similar way. You, um, you don't have as much information to work with because you only have one band, but yes, this workflow could be adapted for elevation data. Um, it currently would expect three band images, but it, it doesn't. It, it would work the same for two and one band images as well. Uh, the problem with elevation data, of course, is that um, it doesn't necessarily uniquely describe a class. So you'd have to be very careful about, um, <laughs> you know, framing the problem essentially that you'd want your uh, high elevation features to be sort of unambiguously high elevation, and your low elevation features or classes to be. So somewhat unambiguously. And then, of course, you could combine uh, RGB images with elevation data too into a four band image, which might be, which might actually be the, the, the ultimate way of doing this. Okay, so I'm going to minimize the chat just for a minute and then going to go back to, uh, to explaining what these, these neural networks are. You can see if we go back to the training here, uh, just to just check in on that real briefly, we can see that um, we're already on. Uh, on the fifth and final training epoch, so that's good. Uh, we can see a few outputs. You'll see different images to me because we're using randomization to call these batches. Um, so you won't see the same images to me, that's not a problem. But hopefully you should see that um, in general, you can see that some of the vegetation is actually being segmented out of the images in a fairly reliable, consistent way. We wouldn't expect the model to perform actually that well over five training epochs, but we'll see in this case, it's, it actually doesn't do too badly. But we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but what it's doing right now is, is essentially uh, solving a giant numerical problem. Um, where you you essentially put one uh, you put your your inputs on one side of the problem and your and your outputs on the other side and this this is just an architecture that's been carefully constructed to extract the features in such a way um, that it would sort of generically be able to predict those those things um, that convolutional neural networks in general are used for image classification problems because they do two things really well. Um, they take advantage of multidimensionality. So going back to um, going back to uh, a couple of questions about using other types of data, other types of you know, raster data. Yeah, it, these convolutional neural networks deal really well with that uh, because they take advantage of local spatial connectivity. Um, the big sticking point with neural networks for the longest time in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s was that the, um, the main layer, the hidden layer, the dense layer, um, is a very, very inefficient way to uh, solve this problem because it connects all, it connects all of your data on, on each node to a dense layer. Um, and so you have, these, you have millions of connections between your, your 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 data and your first hidden layer, but none of those connections have any spatial awareness. So what the, the, the big breakthrough with convolutional neural networks was that they came up with some way that would gonna that would be an efficient way to extract features from from high dimensional data sets like imagery. Um, because um, you have this concept of a receptive field. So the the neuron the, the neuron for every uh, portion of the network um, is not connected to every other portion, but it is connected to a region of portions, and those regions are connected to one another. So it exploits um, stationarity with the image, which is which is sort of repeating patterns throughout the image. 
Now going back to vegetation, obviously, there's all the sorts of repeating patterns for vegetation. Generally, plants are sort of self -like, look similar to one another and very distinct. Um, so, so CNNs are really, really good at taking into account that. Um, so that's essentially why we're using uh, convolutional neural networks. There's obviously many, many more details that I could go into here. Um, but if you followed the intro, intro tutorial that was listed up on the on the main project, uh, course website, then then you would have a sense for how inefficient uh, neural networks were, because we were trying to classify these tiny, tiny, tiny images, and our model was was really giant. But using convolutional neural networks, we've got much bigger images and a much smaller model, and it works a lot better. So that is sort of it's demonstrating uh, that point specifically. Um, so I'll go on to the, the unit um, itself. I, I did provide this video as well, which was made by the authors of the original model. Uh, the, the unit um, came from a paper that was published in 2015. And it was a biomedical research group, um, but also you know, folks who are really heavy into image computation. Um, and it was a brilliant, it was a, a sort of a brilliant stroke of genius in my opinion, because it was the first model out there that really did a good job of combining features at multiple scales. And that is why, that's essentially why the unit is so popular. Uh, you'll, if you did a Google search of units, I'm sure you would hit millions and millions of sites. Um, the reason why they're so uh, popular, in my opinion, is because they combine spatial scales. Um, so if we go back to this, we've, we've got our input image here, we've got our three bands, our R, G, and B. They get sort of condensed down through pooling uh, and convolution. They get condensed down progressively and progressively until you get to this sort of bottleneck feature here, uh, this sort of feature that's only 1,024 digits long, uh, sort of numbers long. And um, that essentially contains all of the information about your specific class. And then it sort of gets upscaled from that. A um, Couple of different details here. One is that the, uh, the, 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 because the, downs, the downscaling uses convolutions um, that sort of spatially share weights, uh, you use a concept called transpose convolution to essentially reconstruct how each set of convolutions would then sort of scale up spatially. So it's a little bit more complicated and, and, and sophisticated than just simple interpolation or something like that. It's actually spatially informed interpolation using uh, weights um, from the convolution layers. And then these gray arrows, um, they're actually uh, those, those points within our model. If we go back to uh, our model back here, just real briefly, and I mentioned these skip connections earlier on, you see that some of these skip connections are really long. Like one, for example, goes all the way down to the bottom or near, near to the bottom. And that's because um, what that's, the, the, the intuition behind that is that anything that's going off on this path over here that's going to be pu pushed through all of the different layers, you know, it's going to be progressively downsized and it's going to have all of its information extracted from it in a very prescribed way. Um, but in the end, it's going to be very sort of low level features that are, that are encapsulated by that process. Uh, very obvious differences uh, between classes uh, as, as represented by image features. But also um, because that sort of, that's going to lose a lot of your, even though the convolution is going to be retaining quite a bit of your spatial information, at the same level, at the same time, you, you are losing some of that spatial information, you're losing some of the very detailed features. And so what this, what this skip connection does is it just sort of adds the, uh, the, the, the output of this, which is still quite large compared to your input imagery, and it just sort of essentially just bypasses it, and in the end, it will just add it. It will just combine those uh, together, or concatenate, it's called. Concatenate those together um, before it actually makes the prediction, and it's designed to preserve both low-level features and high-level features, which is also, I think, why it's somewhat useful for the, the sort of like intermediate scale problems, um, you know, this sort of size uh, imagery where we're looking at maybe tens to hundreds of square meters. Um, but it also works for pretty large imagery and also works for obviously microscopic imagery, which is what it was designed for in the first place. It was actually designed for separating different cells. So that's all I'm going to talk about for the purposes of just moving on here, but I am going to return more. I'm going to return again to, um, to to what a unit really is and what it's doing for us. But I just wanted to show you the, you know, the process of actually training this model. We did this over just five training epochs. Um, and if you, if you noticed, if you saw some of the scores down here, you'll notice that 
Our dice coefficient, which goes between zero and one, is pretty high. Our IOU is a little lower, and um, our validation sets are not too bad, like seven, 78. Um, uh, that sort of would roughly translate to like a 78% accuracy and 65% accuracy. So, and that's for individual batches. So you can see that it's doing, it's doing fairly well. Um, but it's not as good as it might get um, over many, many training epics. And you can see that um, if you go, if you go have a look here, it, it's quite remarkable actually that the model could figure out really where the vegetation was um, for the training data set, which is the blue line, um, to an accuracy of about 87% just in the, after the first training epoch, which is amazing really, and, and not typical. Uh, typically you'll see things start right at the bottom and then they'll, they'll get to that point. They may get to that point. Um, but for vegetation and for this particular data set, there's a very good class to work with because it's, it, it's, it, it shows that you can train this model pretty well just in a few training e uh, epochs. But you can see that the, uh, the model hasn't necessarily generalized that well to the data. There's still some room for improvement there. Uh, because you can see that the the valid even the, the the training is the sort of score is going up and up. The validation score is bouncing around quite a bit, and it's doing that because it's seeing a new batch every time, and that batch might have contained something that's unusual or not seen by the model before. And so, really, um, you know, you you'd probably in this case want to train for a few uh, quite a few more epochs because you want that validation score to sort of start leveling out. You want two things really. You want um, you want consistency. Uh, in your scores and, you, and of course you want your scores to be high in the first place. And over here on this right hand side I just plotted the mean IOU as a function of dice coefficient. In this example they, they, they track pretty well, uh, the correlated, the, the, the mean IOU is, is significantly smaller though because um, it's, it's, it's biased towards that, uh, that other class. The, the dice coefficient in this case is a better metric for us because it, it's going to be uh, enumerating the 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 um, the overlap of our predicted class with our ground truth class, but in such a way that it doesn't uh, get biased by the size of that of that class. And everyone's going to get different curves to me because everyone used slightly different um, batches during the training. But the expectation is that everyone would sort of converge to the same number um, after a certain amount of time. So here is a convenient way to just quickly test that model. Um, what we're doing here is uh, creating a new generator just from our test files this time. So that's the set of file, the third set of files that we haven't yet used. Um, I'm giving it the same arguments, same size, same class number, same batch size. And it's just gener it's going to be generating um, sort of scores. It's going to basically give the model eight new images at a time. And it's going to just keep doing that until all of the images are used up essentially. And um, the only reason to use steps in this case would be um, because this is now a CPU bound uh, problem. It's using the CPUs, it's using one of your cores to do this and you may run out of RAM if you didn't have a lot of RAMs. So I'm, I'm showing you a, a workflow here that involves this intermediate steps called, <laughs> step called steps and that's for the purposes of, of, of feeding that to, to this part, portion of the, of the function. And you can see that my test score, this is my, my, my average dice coefficient now for the entire test set. It's about uh, almost 80%, which is pretty de decent. I uh, mean, IOU of 66 is also pretty decent for a mean IOU score. Um, people tend to say that IOU scores are pretty good if they're more than 0.5. Um, but that's not very satisfactory either. So dice loss is a bit better. Um, it's a bit more sensitive metric. So here I'm just printing those two numbers out in a in a in formatted way. So I'm saying, okay, my loss, my my loss here is 0.2. My loss can go down to zero. Zero is what I want. So obviously there's a little bit more room for improvement there that hopefully I can get through training the model for a few more epochs. But already my uh, dice score for this particular class is almost 80%, which is pretty decent. And so here I'm using the test generator to just generate a bunch of images. And then here I'm I'm just going to uh, feed. Uh, each one of those, uh, each each one of those images in the batch, um, to my model to the predict function here. It's going to generate a mask, and I'm just going to plot it. And so this is just a really quick way to see how good the model seems to be doing. A more visually intuitive way. Uh, you can see, oh, in this case, it, it's pretty bad. This is the worst one I've seen so far. So this is good. Um, we've got some. It did really well for this particular image here. Pulled out all of these individual plots. Did okay for pulling out the vegetation in this one. 
uh, did all right in some of these, but it did pretty badly when it, when it was confronted with a picture of open water with a boat. Um, everything went into the everything else class and it's picking up, you can see it's picking up on the foam from the boat and it's picking up on the surface texture from the waves, which is, which is sort of what, it's, what, it, what it really wants to do because it's picking up on similar features of vegetation. But obviously in this class, it needs, in this case, it needs quite a few more training epics to get to a point where it's not going to confuse water uh, and vegetation. But in general, that's actually pretty decent for a model that we've just sort of picked, picked and uh, trained for only five epochs. Um, but just to show you what that could look like, um, obviously I went ahead and I did this for a few more. And so um, what this, this bit of code, you've already seen this function a few different times when we've been downloading data from my Google Drive. This time I'm just pulling in this H5 file that contains weights, trained exactly the same data set and same workflow, same everything. But this time I just trained it for 100 epochs instead. And then, I, and then I'm gonna actually just load those weights um, to my model. So destination is, is, in this case, is this file. And you'll see it's been downloaded over here. Uh, it's the one that has vegetation written out, not veg, vegetation. And it has 100 ebooks. So I'm going to load those weights to my model. Um, when you load the, when you save the weights in that H5 format, uh, it, it's already structured in such a way that the model knows exactly what to do with those weights and it puts them in the right place. And then this time I'm going to run that same function, uh, same evaluate function that I did before, but this time I'm going to just use the, um, just use the, uh, the, the, sorry, using the model that has these new weights loaded to it. And hopefully you'll see that the, the scores are a lot better. You'll see this, particularly you'll see this mean IOU score go uh, significantly up. And then here, these next two cells, um, are just going to be doing the same thing as I did before. Um, it's going to be generating a new batch. Um, once this is done, it's going to generate a new batch and it's going to plot them. But the, the one different thing that I've done this time is, of course, I, this time I want to actually upscale it to its original size. My imagery was 720 by 720 originally. The size of the imagery that I gave the model was 512 by 512. So this time I'm just going to do a, a, an interpolation. I'm just going to resize it. I'm going to take the I'm going to take the image and resize that, um, but I'm going to give the uh, the image the same size as what it needs as what it expects, which is 512. So here I've got the image that's uh, that's been sort of inherited here, and then it's just passing through here. The, um, the prediction happens here, and then the resizing happens there, and then it just plots. Um, and you can see that it does much better this time. This time we have a picture of open water that's similar to the boat example, but this time it hasn't picked up on those surface textures. Um, it's learned over those 100 epochs, it's learned how to deal with that situation better. Um, I think that is a pretty good place to end. I'm, it, we have 10 minutes left. I do have a whole, uh, a whole section on transfer learning though that can wait till tomorrow. Uh, because there's quite a lot of detail there that I don't want to rush through. And we have, we have quite a lot of time tomorrow because tomorrow's lesson is a little bit shorter than today's. So um, I just want to end with this recap here, and then I'm going to spend the, next, uh, spend the last 10 minutes asking any questions that you have so far. Um, so just to recap then, we took this uh, data set, we made it a residual UNET model. We didn't get as far as talking about what the residual part means in that, uh, but we talked a bit about the UNET and why it's, uh, why it's useful. Um, I would encourage you to uh, play with this a bit because we're, we're looking at a curated example here for vegetation that worked really well. You can see that uh, it worked with a, a dice score of 98%, so it's 98% accurate. It's, even its IOU score is 95, which is really, really, really good for this type of model. Um, and obviously I think a lot of you would, be, uh, would find that acceptable if that translated over to your problems in your data. But I would encourage you to play around with this a little bit. Um, particularly, choose a class that's very small. You know, there's a drone there, there's some objects in here, there's some people. Um, you'll see that the model takes a lot longer to train um, for these very small objects. You know, because these very small objects, they don't, they, they, they're not represented very much in the, in the, cat, in the training catalog as much as vegetation is. We're giving it loads and loads and loads and loads of examples of vegetation all the time. But for smaller objects, there may be, there may be only, um, you know, a 10% of the imagery that even has that object in it. So 
that's a good case to play with uh, to see sort of how bad you might do for those very rare objects or very rare cases. And it might give you a sense for how to actually label your imagery and transfer these workflows over. Um, in general, these workflows work pretty well for these uh, very distinct classes and very large classes. Uh, the small classes do work too. Um, not saying that they don't. I've got a uh, one, one, a couple of different projects where they've worked really well, but I've also had to play around with the training and the loss function and various things to, to get it to work. The um, those sorts of topics are sort of touching more upon that second one that I that, that second more advanced tutorial that I linked to at the end of my of the of the course web page. That's not quite finished yet. Apologies for that. That will be finished pretty soon. Um, just give, give me another couple of days and I'll get that back up. So when that, when that is up, I'll, I'll share that around. And you'll see how you might take this workflow and make it a little bit more complicated um, or, or, or at least adapt it to a more complicated data set. Um, so we've got eight minutes left. I'm going to go over to the questions and see what we've got. Um, so. Danica says, from your diagram, it looks like the final resolution would be coarser than your original resolution. That's right. Yep, we, we're, we're using uh, 512 pixel imagery throughout. Um, and that's why we're upscaling it at the end. Yeah. So it's going to be uh, estimating something that's going to be the same size as the inputs that we gave it, but potentially those inputs are smaller than what the originals were. Um, is there a way to set a seed? Yes, of course. That's a good. Comp that's a good, good, good point. I don't know if I did that, so that's really well. Yeah. So in here, we can use random choice, and we can set a seed. We can give it a seed there. So seed, seed is for the random number generator that we're using. Um, and by setting a seed, um, by setting a seed, we're essentially ensuring that. Uh, we're pulling the same fi uh, random files as, as much as we possibly can. Um, the, yeah, there's a section that shows you how to do that. Can I clarify class versus label? Apologies, I'm using those terms interchangeably. Uh, they are the same thing. The class is the thing that you're interested in. The label is the representation that you've made of, those, of that class in your image. So I guess they are slightly separate things. It goes, it goes back to that point. Um, made earlier on about you know how detailed do you need to be in your labeling? Ideally, you need to be quite detailed in your labeling because you you know you want to capture just the thing that you're interested in. So I guess um, that would be where I would make the distinction between class and label. I guess the class is the thing that you're trying to label imperfectly. Um, okay, so. I don't see any more questions there. Is anyone got any questions they'd like to use their voices to communicate? So we, we did get it all the way to the bottom, um, but I think that's not a problem because uh, almost all of you are signed up for both, um, for both days. And basically tomorrow we're gonna start um, here and we're gonna move on to the, to the next part of the workflow. But the, I, I want to start here because it demonstrates um, something that could be potentially useful for folks and that's transfer learning. So what we did was um, we created a model for a particular class and then we made some weights. We could actually take those weights um, and, uh, and apply them to a different model that we're going to point to a different data set for the same class. So you'll see just a, a sneak peek of tomorrow, we'll see that we're using this thing called the semantic drone data set. I chose this data set specifically because it had vegetation in it too, um, but it actually has a few different classes of vegetation, trees, grass, vegetation, bald trees. So what we're going to do tomorrow is combine those classes together and see how well uh, um, our model weights that we transferred from our previous model for the air escapes data transfer to our uh, semantic drone data. And, that, and by initializing the model with those weights, we're sort of giving it like a hot start. So if you're a numerical modeler, you might be familiar with the process of hot starting a model. And essentially that's what we're doing here. We're just sort of giving it a bit of a leg up in terms of how it, how it sort of starts to, to tease out this big problem. Um, so by giving it a, um, a, a set of weights that worked well for another data set, uh, and then training on top of those, uh, on top of that, um, we give it a much better chance to converge uh, more quickly towards what we want. And that's what I'm going to start with tomorrow. 
Um, so go back to the questions. So would you start building your model um, with these type of stock classified images then use? Yeah, potentially that's a good way to do it. So that's sort of what I'm talking about in terms of transfer learning. Um, you could take, uh, you could train a model on an existing data set like this, where the labels are already made for you. Uh, because the labels, you know, labeling is a very time consuming and difficult thing to do. And in fact, is the most difficult thing about the whole thing um, in many ways. So yes, I think training, uh, to, at least developing an understanding of how these things work using other people's data is definitely a good idea before you start to embark upon a big labeling exercise, because maybe this particular model is not going to work for you and you won't discover that until too late. But also, if you do decide to use this particular model or any type of model, yes, transfer learning is your friend. Take the weights from that same class or similar class uh, that's been sort of maybe learned over a bigger data set um, or, ma or many more training epochs or whatever, um, and then transfer it over. So yeah, if you don't have many thousands of um, images, of course, that's obviously where you have to start. You have to start with some form of transfer learning, I think, to, to, to get you to some, to some point. Um, and the great thing about it is that, you know, you'll see in the workflow that we, we go through tomorrow, you'll see how well that it does transfer to a completely different data set um, with different vantage, different altitude, different number of pixels, different spatial resolution, everything's different. The only thing that's the same really is that it's an RGB image and it has vegetation in it. And hopefully um, that will demonstrate to you my point. Um, so this is the last question I'm gonna answer because we're gonna stop in two minutes. Um, so if you want to look at image classification of Landsat images, would a CNN be a better option than what we did today? And how different is that to set up? We didn't, uh, that is what we use today. We did use a CNN. A unit is just a type of CNN. So CNN is a convolutional neural network, which is a specific type of deep learning algorithm that is useful, particularly for imagery and for image classification. Um, the unit that we used is a type of CNN. And the specific type of unit that we used that we didn't really get in too much of the details is a type of uh, CNN as well. So this, would this same workflow would translate over to Landsat images. Whether or not it would be as effective, I don't know, and I encourage you to have a look at that. But you would set it up in, in essentially the same way. Uh, the only thing you would probably pay attention to would be um, you know, choosing a size of image that worked well with the, with the model and that fit inside your hardware. Um, okay, so that is two hours up. Um, 